You're listening to Conversations with Lulu. My guest today is Nadim Samara, CEO of the Omnicum Media Group, or OMG, for the MENA region. Their clients include brands like Jumeirah Group, Do, Pepsi, Nissan, and the list goes on. Nadim is a childhood friend, and he was gracious enough to be one of the first guests a few months ago, just before the measures to contain the spread of the coronavirus took over. I remember talking to him about retirement, and he told me he hopes to become a teacher someday, perhaps inspired by his own mother. She was an Arabic teacher. And okay. How's your Arabic? Terrible. Uh, <laughs> terrible. It, it, uh, it's good in slang, but it's not good in, uh, it's not good in professional Arabic. But I think I'd, that's one of the disappointments probably from her side. <laughs> but um, look, it, it was, uh, you know, she's, she's, she's relatively strict, uh, but she was, very, she was very flexible in our upbringing. Like how we actually, uh, you know, you know whether we went to sports or we went to scouts or we did skiing or whatever it was, there was an investment from her side in terms of the emotion, the financial, obviously, but it was always also about the, it was always about the, uh, the fun aspect, the growth. And I think that's the mentality that was important. Any teacher wants their student to grow. I think that's the that's the thing I can pull out from this from this experience is the growth mentality. Um, but again, uh, you know, Arabic is unless you, unless you study it with with uh, with with a full heart, it's a bit of a tough uh, tough language. I think we should start with the interesting stories. Let's talk a All little right. bit about your adventures. Well, um, more recently, the company uh, that I work for, Omnicom Media Group, came up with this uh, challenge uh, every twelve to eighteen months, where uh, we'd select a, a group of folks. A group of people around 25, 25 of us um, that would partner up with uh, Gulf for Goods, and we would look into raising funds for mainly we focus on children in need, orphanages, education, and the bug kind of bit in terms of uh, getting into remote areas, uh, challenging ourselves physically and mentally. Um, and it started in um, September 2014 when 25 of us attempted to climb. Kilimanjaro, uh, the highest peak in Africa. Wow! Uh, in fact, uh, when you're climbing high up, my my right foot became known as don't, and my ref- left foot became known as stop. So every time I took two steps, it'd be don't stop, because <laughs> it's a sixty percent of the. In my opinion, sixty percent of this effort is is mental. So you have to have the mental strength to to pursue it. So yeah, so so this whole expedition bug bit us. You know, we're sitting around uh, a dining room table and we're having uh, we're having a bite, all of us together, uh, a bunch of friends of uh, close friends of, of mine and I. And one of them uh, throws out this whole idea of let's ski the last degree, which is basically uh, some folks fly you in a helicopter, drop you in at 89 degree parallel. And then you put on cross country skis and you drag behind you a sled with your tent and stuff for uh, an Arctic expedition of around 8 to 12 days and then you ski that last degree between 89 and 90 and 90 is obviously the true north pole and um, with global warming happening um, you know who knows how long the ice pack will actually still exist so i'd like to be one of i'd like to be one of the few people that actually stood on on the north pole and i think it's not only just a, a nice story to say it's also inspiration to my children it's also a physical challenge, you know, uh, to make sure that I'm I'm as fit as possible, uh, despite my love for food, <laughs> uh, and and obviously the the mental strength that that comes with it, you know, um, the routine of of setting up a tent every day, bringing it down in the morning, uh, making sure you don't do any stupid mistakes like having um, some of your breath come on your zippers because then it'll freeze because the temperature is between minus five inside the tent to minus twenty, minus thirty even minus 40 if there's a, a lot of wind. So uh, making sure that your, your muscles are well taken care of for eight to 12 days, you know, it becomes very monotonous to a point of enjoyment. So you, you said that it all started with a group of friends and you sitting around the table. I'm assuming these friends are colleagues. Yeah, I mean, most of us are colleagues uh, or ex-colleagues, but you need to be really intimate with someone and really close. I mean, it's a, it's a partnership. If you're sharing a, sp- a very small space for for eight to twelve days in conditions where you can't just go to the guest bedroom or to the next yeah. hotel room <laughs> or to another town, 
Very true. So obviously, not a lot of companies do that. Sometimes corporates might do corporate retreats where they mm. kind of drag everyone somewhere. Mm. Uh, this seems so organic, kind of mm. like uh, a bottom-up uh, mm. approach in a way. Yeah. So, so why why is that important? Do you think, like, to you and and also to the to the company? I think again, it it comes it comes down from the from the the DNA of the company and the values that are in, enlisted in 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 our um, in our culture. And it's in my opinion, if you have sweat equity with the person next to you, with your peer, with your colleague, then you have a responsibility to make sure that you're delivering the best you can the best product, uh, the best service. And we, we're talking literally sweat now. Literally, okay. literally, <laughs> uh, both inside the office sometimes, <laughs> and but most, most notoriously climbing mountains and, and, and skiing across uh, an Arctic uh, float. You know, I started in this company in Jeddah uh, 17 and a half years ago. So it's kind of ingrained in my mind that we're one family, we pursue one goal, and, um, and, and you kind of have to perform together. Take those words, one family, one goal, pursue it together, and it applies to climbing a mountain, it applies to crossing an Arctic float. And I think that's important for us to figure to figure out how a, a company can perform better. Um, and and it, again, it reflects back to cert, certain numbers in the company. You know, the majority of uh, our team and the leadership team has been in the company north of 12 years. This is a 17-year, 18-year company. So that's a big, big, big number, that's right? That's excellent. Uh, in an industry where churn is huge, yeah. uh, average age has now risen from the, around 27 and a half, 28, back three, four years ago, uh, to around 32, 33. And that's only because of the fact that people stay. So it's not about, it's not about uh, the influx of the young folks. It's about the, the, the steady and strong and stable leadership that has been with the company since 2002. Which now you took over uh, yes. recently, so congratulations Thank on you. that. It's it's an amazing achievement when I think about it. You're 41 years old. You're uh, a father. You're an adventurer. You're you're a leader. Um, uh, what what kind of message do you think it sends to the the new recruits into mm. into OMG? Um, because you know when when you're young and you look at someone who's 41 years old and he's a CEO, um, is that important for you? It's less about how do we get to this position. It's more about the journey, right? And I, th I know it's a bit of a cliche, but it literally is the journey. Because if it wasn't, if it wasn't for me, having the support at home with my spouse, the support at the office with my mentors, uh, and most recently Eli being my direct mentor, uh, but there have been mentors in the past in the in the in the uh, Saudi office, and I was when I was in New York for six years. I had the luxury of having some great mentors, also some terrible ones that taught me what not to do. Yeah. Uh, so, so you obviously draw from the ones that that have coached you correctly. So, uh, yes, I think this is. I think it's more of a message to the to the folks that are entering the company about the fact that this is a journey and not a destination. I'll tell you what. I think the combination of perseverance, um, I, I, and I don't want to use the word hard hard work because I think. Smart work is better than hard work at some at some point in time, uh, but perseverance, and kind of you know taking tough decisions, being opportunistic, you know when I was 28 I moved to New York it wasn't an easy decision, uh, but I believe it was the right decision, um, and what I what I gained there, uh, I lost some stuff from being in, uh, I lost some experience from being in the GCC in the Middle East and North Africa, but I gained a, a new perspective by being in North America, and I think that gave me a bit of an edge. Uh, also, I had access to a great university where, where I pursued my executive MBA. Is th was that a contributing factor in, uh, in who you are today? Like, would you, would you advise people to kind of seek these uh, types of executive education uh, for their progress? Look, I mean, it, 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 um, it doesn't hurt if you, know what you, if you know what you're trying to achieve, right? I think if you're, if you're doing it because you want to put a, an, A4, an A4 thick paper behind your desk <laughs> as a as a as a bit of a prize then i think those days are gone right uh, it's not a stamp of approval but the most important thing in my opinion isn't to seek education for the sake of education but to seek education for the sake of application and i think that's very important uh, so when i did my uh, my business school experience it was during working time so i i did i did this every other weekend 
uh, where I was able to apply throughout these fortnights whatever I learned in two days, which was pretty cool. Um, but yeah, I think I think there's 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 two good answers in my opinion. And one bad answer. One bad answer is the more degrees the better. I think that that's that that um, ethos has has evaporated. But the two good answers is first of all pursue something you love, and the second piece of advice is I think it's best to also pursue a progressive education system because the majority of folks we meet today and we interview and we recruit, um, they graduate from institutions that may not have set them up for the best future success. Uh, that doesn't mean that, you know, that we have to break down the whole institutions of education, but which is a top topic that's being challenged worldwide, but it's something that we should be, uh, um, you know, much more assertive of, of how and where we put our investments as 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 parents as as uh, educators and as students i think as uh, uh, several reports talk about the skills gap right so mm. there's a lot of people graduating and are unemployed but there's also a lot of companies that are unable to hire the the skills that they're looking for mm. which is interesting so there is a mismatch somewhere Absolutely. between what's out there and what's uh, really in demand um but when it comes to hiring, right? I mean, obviously, how many people work at the group now today? So we're we're slightly north of eight hundred across Middle East and North oh. Africa. So so when it comes to hiring, from your perspective as an employer, what do you look for in mm. a new entrance? Like mm. so. Well, we're definitely not looking at degrees only. I think that's uh, that's a red herring that uh, companies have um, uh, fallen fallen into the trap. We we look for personalities. Uh, the old adage of. Um, recruit for attitude and teach aptitude uh, after you recruit someone is something we apply. So the majority of our recruits are entry level for two reasons. As I mentioned before, we have a very strong uh, retention uh, figure in terms of percentage. So folks that come in stay with us uh, in, in, in the majority of, of the sense. And the second thing is I, I was brought up in an environment and I'm a true uh, believer in not getting someone senior from outside that would suppress the ambitions of the folks you've been building up Absolutely. and teaching. Now, sometimes it's a necessity, right? Sometimes you win a massive account, your skill sets don't exist, um, and you have to bring in a, a general manager. That Those are necessary evil decisions you have to take. Uh, and you have to have those bold decisions sometimes. When I interview someone after the fact, so after they've been recruited, by, by the agency leads nowadays or the discipline leads, I look for three things. Um, I look for integrity, first and foremost. I think that's something that we sometimes take for granted and sometimes folks don't understand how important it is. And it doesn't mean in terms of integrity, in terms of audit proof, but in terms of how does that person compose themselves in tough environment. Um, I think positive is the second thing I look at. So someone who... Um, gets punched left, right, and center, but always has a smile on their face to move forward. I think we're, we have to remind ourselves we're in a service industry, despite the technology pressures around us, uh, and AI, and ML, and automation, and all the other acronyms that are coming our way. Ultimately, we're a human industry that deals with humans. Um, and the third, but not the last thing, is resilience. Um, we're a very cool industry. We're a very fun industry. We help build brands. We connect people to brands that they will have a, a love relationship with, or a hate relationship with. Our job is to make sure that it's it's the former, not the latter. But resilience is very important, right? And I think um, getting a brief at 6.30 at, in the afternoon on a Thursday, uh, there are folks that will react positively to it, will be resilient, uh, and will treat it with integrity in terms of performance and quality. And there are folks that won't. And we want to kind of hire the folks that will. You mentioned a word which has been thrown around a lot these days, which is intrapreneurship. Mm. How can you apply it in, in a big company, in an established company? Mm. Because I can see it, obviously, in startups. Uh, it's very easy. Um, I can see it maybe in smaller companies to some degree. Mm. But, I mean, you have something that's been running since, you know, you said 2002. Uh, so so you're set in your ways. Mm. You know, there are probably things, uh, things are done in a specific way. Um, so how, how can you be intrapreneurial? Mm, good question. Uh, and I agree with you. I think, um, you know, we're, we're, we're 17, 18 years old. So we're actually a teenager of a company. And, and we, need, we know that 17, 18 year olds can either be 
uh, they're pivoting. They either be uh, troublesome or or or, or successful. <laughs> so we're definitely in that in that pivotal area. Now, when we started, we were around 25 people. It was it was very organically organic for us to come up with solutions. Uh, you know, macros on Excel, package it up, and there we have we have a sophisticated tool compared to the market. The competitive advantage was available. The competitive advantage was available. Today, you need to make sure that you have a system behind it for 800 people. And that system has lots of small tactics. So we've created something small last year called OMD Underground, where, as as it says, it's kind of like a, a reverse mentorship, where we identified five folks under the manager level, or at manager level, rather, uh, who we knew were brilliant. But instead of them getting stuck into the day-to-day, we pulled them out and we said, great, here's 30 minutes with, with your CEO, sit down with this, uh, with this individual and tell me what your passion point out is about this, uh, this business. So let's, let's shift the conversa- uh, conversation a little bit and uh, talk a little bit about the industry. So uh, there's a lot of debate, obviously, about the, the, the viability of the model on the longer term, especially with you know, the big players and uh, the and the, the digital aggregators, basically, that are uh, controlling a big chunk of the market. Would you say that it's an industry under disruption or under transformation? Uh, our industry changes weekly. And I love that. And I think that's the that's the, the that's the piece that that keeps me excited and wakes me up in the morning to go to work and to make sure that we, we create the best solutions possible. Um, every technology that comes around will affect us. AR, VR, any other acronym you have out there, eventually will impact advertising, eventually impact audiences, eventually will impact transactions between consumers and brands. And businesses, whether private or public, right, uh, will always need people to open up the wallet and swipe their credit card or tap their phone or hand over cash. And that for me is what makes us in a constant transformation. Where do you think is the the the, the biggest value? Is it? I mean, who is your your uh, your client? Let's say, is it the the large companies, or or is there an interest on, you know, your behalf to start sort of working with the with the smaller SMEs, the startups? Well, historically, we've always had historically this industry has been built on building big brands, okay. right? So if you've watched Mad Men. That's that's basically our heritage, okay. uh, with the good and the bad. But re- more recently, and specifically from an OMG perspective, we've been very uh, acute to making sure that we diversify who our customers are, who our partners are as well, because it's it's on both sides of the of the of the equation. Um, and we've been very we've been very successful, and we're very proud of actually launching brands that have started from zero. So the focus, obviously, at least for the for the short term or the medium term, is still going to be on the the big, you know, the big players, the big brands that are looking to uh, expand their footprint, basically. Yeah, I think. Look, uh, I'll, I'll I'll give you I'll give you the most direct answer. Uh, we're we're built we're built in a way, the industry the 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 structure of this industry has built has been built in a way where there's either money going direct. To publishers nowadays, or big brands that need to outsource the the um, uh, the specialization and the and the knowledge going to the to the agency holding companies, whether it's creative or media or otherwise. But I think that's that's changing. Despite the data and technology, it's a human industry. Intu- intuitive decision making is still very valid. Um, understanding how to merge disparate databases into one is an advantage that an agency today has and will continue to have until, I don't know, maybe Google, Amazon, and Facebook have a database between the three of them. Um, that's not going to happen. So today, if, if, a, if, a, if a brand or a client wants to make sure that they're getting the most objective point of view, um, then they should set up a remuneration system that's exactly built on performance to the agency, and they should be briefing the agency on the exact business outcome that's needed. Is that how you work now? Or is that something that you you see more clients demanding, like more accountability on the on the part of the agency? We've we've we're shifting there. Okay. If, if, if I were to tell you that the majority is there, I'd be lying and I won't say that. But okay. I'll tell you that there are some bold uh, leaders 
bold partners as well who are taking decisions that are much more finite. I use this analogy of bridging. bridging. So today, uh, I want to see shorter bridges made out of concrete rather than longer bridges made out of bamboo. Okay. And in the past, you'd, you'd advertise, hope for someone to see it, hope for someone to, rem- to remember it, yeah. and then ultimately go to, go to the market uh, as a retailer, let's say, and hopefully go to that shelf for that brand. Those are lots of bamboo bridges that are pretty long. Um, nowadays, the data has allowed us to make sure that we're segregating the audiences correctly, have immediate transaction on the platform that we're able to advertise on, and immediately make sure that the product is, is made available or the brand has made a transaction with that consumer. So the landscape is shifting slightly, right? Digital is becoming a very big channel Mm -hmm. uh, for most brands Uh, traditional channels are shrinking print tv Mm. as well Uh, Mm. uh, so it's it's a matter of time i think until the you know maybe new channels are going to be there or Mm. or these existing channels keep eating up uh, a bigger share let's say of the pie Mm. again how do you um, reinvent yourself as a as an agency yeah very good question so again i think uh, let's let's take a step back in terms of in terms of spending. I want to say that half of the investments toward go towards digital. Now that said, um, we also need to be conscious about how we term TV and how we term digital, right? So video exists whether it's done through the cable or done through the Ethernet or Internet or Wi-Fi or 3G or 5G nowadays. So we want to also make sure that's a content-driven dissection of the industry and not a distribution driven dissection of the industry okay um now obviously uh we have in this region we're pretty strong on outdoor still tv still has its equity there's a lot of uh, research that allows us to connect tv to performance on social and performance on, on on digital which we've pioneered with partners of ours here so it's a much more convoluted response than maybe four years ago where four years ago you'd say, great, uh, TV is kind of standing still and digital is picking up. Today it's much more convoluted. And um, again, another cliche that's being used in this, in, this, uh, in this industry is omni-channel, to making sure that the consumer, mm-hmm. wherever they turn, is a seamless experience yeah. uh, of, the brand's, of the brand's communication. Um, how do we solve for it? And how do we foresee things? Um, first and foremost, it's the structure at the company. Right, so we've been able to diversify our skill sets in the past six, seven years. Uh, we've been able to create um, new revenue streams, both for the company, but also for the clients. Ultimately, we've set up a uh, e-commerce uh, uh, entity within Omnicom Media Group. We've we've set up a creative, that's uh, entity that's focused mainly on rapid response management for social media, uh, for dynamic creative optimization, and technology that has helped us to gain double digit enhancements on the same creative that's that's produced in a nanosecond based on the audience it's, it's sending out to, individualized, uh, making sure that the data that we have is harmonized together on a DMP that is uh, a data management platform that is referenced every time we go to market. And this precision marketing mentality uh, can't be operated by the same recruit you used to recruit 25 years ago. I could I could tell that you keep a very kind of tight ship when it comes to culture. Mm. Uh, I could see that it's very important. But are there any key strategies that you recommend or that you use as a as a leader that sort of keeps you uh, you know keeps you afloat and uh, and helps you mm. um, have more vision or more foresight into the future and and keep growing? I'm I'm definitely um, I'm definitely doing doing two things all the time. First thing is I always keep my ear to the ground. Um, I usually meet uh, three or four external parties. Let's use those terms, whether they're partners or clients or, or you know, uh, affiliates uh, every day. And that allows me to ask questions, to sense what's going on. Um, and, you know, we're lucky enough to have uh, clients in every single sector. So in, in, in a week, uh, I can have a very strong uh, understanding of what the barometer is looking like across the economy. Okay. Point two is while your ears on the ground, make sure your eyes are really, really, really far ahead, right? Uh, so it's all about vision over visibility. Um, I think we're all concerned about visibility into the next quarter. I'm concerned about the vision into the next year. 
you know and I think for me uh, what I'm hearing nowadays in terms of what makes sense in the coming year or two clients want outcomes that make sense and it's not about the price only it's not about the service quality only it's about the bouquet and this is graduating from the procurement era of three four years ago where it's all about price and I think brands realized that great they were paying the cheapest available but they weren't performing the best available um you mentioned uh, when we were having a chat at the beginning that you you're always prepared mm. um, where, where does that come from and, and is there something particular in, in your childhood that you think prepared you to where you are today mm. I, I was I was in the Scouts for 18 years and and the mentality with Scouts uh, well back in the 80s it was for fun right you you'd, you'd go out you'd go out you'd go hiking you'd go camping uh, bonfires um, and it was all fun but eventually it became some sort of a habit you know and the, the motto the motto for for Scouts is be prepared um, so you always have that mentality you know so I'm, I'm you know whenever I travel my backpack I, I travel the backpack I don't travel with a briefcase because I think that's that's not practical I'd like to have both hands available for for passports and boarding passes and phones and stuff like that but I always have a t-shirt in my backpack in case I get stranded in some airport or and it's, it's you know it weighs probably 400 grams or 300 <laughs> grams but it's, it's not about that it's about the fact that the men- mentally you're, you're being prepared it, it, it reflects very much equally to business right so when you enter in a meeting um, the brasher part of me when I was younger in this industry I'd be the first person to speak I'd be the first person to give an opinion I'd, I'd set the tone and I think nowadays with a bit more maturity and a bit more experience I've understood that being prepared doesn't mean being the first to speak but being the person who's able to either collate different opinions instigate more discussion uh, but ultimately bring bring everybody into the right decision making process and I think you need to have enough uh, baggage, uh, whether it's emotional baggage, uh, mental baggage, or actually physical baggage, that be able to actually last nine hours of 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 a day in advertising is not physically easy. <laughs> you know, um, you know there are folks that take smoke breaks every every two hours. There are folks that that uh, rely on chocolate, like I do sometimes, uh, and there are folks that do yoga in the morning and afternoon. So uh, again, it's the physical, mental, and emotional. Prepared preparedness that's important for for you to be successful in my opinion. Okay, and you're and you're a father now. Yes, uh, I mean you're a father of three. Yeah, which is uh, quite the task. Um, yes. So what what kind of uh, you know lessons do you draw from your mother, from maybe things you've learned along the way from your career uh, that yeah. you kind of apply in uh, at home? Are are there any lessons or any patience. tactics? P- uh, patience. I have no idea how how parents are as patient as they should be. And I don't know where I'm digging in for my patients sometime. Um, and then sleep. Uh, just any opportunity I have to sleep, I sleep. Uh, planes, cars, uh, couches. Uh, with three kids uh, ranging from the ages of seven to one, uh, it's it's a handful. But um, look, the, the, the two things that I think my kids have taught me uh, was the unconditional love that they get. You know, you have... That they give. That they, that they, that they give me back. Yeah. Um, so it's not... So when you have when when you when you're in a relationship with us with your spouse, there is unconditional love, right? But it's 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 not at the same level with your with your children. Uh, and I and I say this with all with all confidence, having had this discussion with my spouse and, and her concurring as well. And I think the second thing that, that I think not many not many uh, spouses would say that the love is unconditional, but that good. We'll we'll uh, we'll, we'll keep it at that. But, <laughs> but but I think the second thing that they've taught me is is how fast they can learn something. And how stupid would I be if I'm not willing to learn something new? And I think it, I'm dumbfounded how fast they pick up th- something, uh, whether it's spelling a new word or reading uh, a different level of uh, of book or uh, knowing what sort of um, what sort of stone is under them when we go hiking in, in the mountains here in the UAE. Whatever it is, their their aspect of speed to learning, curiosity is inspirational. And I think we sometimes forget it, you know. At, at in, we forget in, to be kids. Yeah, we forget to be kids. Yeah. I think that's a very good that's a very good word. How do you how do you feel about uh, their future? I mean, uh, are you optimistic about you know how how what do you think is going to happen in the next twenty years from a career <sighs> standpoint, from a from a leadership standpoint? I mean, yeah. If I knew the answer, I'd be uh, <laughs> I'd be probably retired someplace. Um, look. I, 
the, the turmoil that this world is going through today um, is probably the the most it's been through, not only because of the the biggest population on earth or the fastest rate of whatever that's happening in the world, but it's also because of the communication. It's because of, again, going back to technology and, and platforms that are making everything visible. I mean, we know here in Dubai if there's a cat stuck in Missouri in some tree, <laughs> yeah. right? Before it used to be whether or not you're in that exact town, whether that cat is stuck in that tree or not. So that, that, that uh, breaking down of borders is making us think that this world is much worse than it used to be. So I'm, so I'm a bit more optimistic than others. Good. But I'm also not naive. And I do believe that my three kids have to work their tail off to make sure that they, they cut their own slack, that they're brought up um, as much as possible in an environment where uh, they're positive, they have full integrity, and they're resilient to make sure that they're able to perform moving forward. Um, and I, I don't want to sound like a father that manages the, his kids in the same way that he manages his company. Uh, and I do treat m- the company as my own company, otherwise I think we'd fail. Um, but I do treat my kids in a way that I think I'm setting them up to be the best they can be, the happiest they can be, which I think is a very important metric that none of us look at, and more importantly, uh, good people. Right? I think that that's what's missing around the world. Uh, but good people doesn't mean that you get stomped on, doesn't mean you get bullied on. Um, and I think today what they've gone through, what they will be going through in school and in high school is a much thicker, need, necess- necessitates a much thicker set of skin and mental strength than we had 25, 15 years ago, or whatever it was. And I think that's something that we need to be a bit more conscious about. Uh Nadim, you're you're very big on life. Mm. I know you personally. You you uh, you love the outdoors. You're you're very uh, uh, experimental. Let's put mm. it this way. You know you 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 love your work. You love your family. Um, do you do? You, I mean, you have a lot of hobbies. Maybe you can mention some mm. of them. Uh, obviously, your love of ca- your love of cars and building cars. Infamous. W- um, do you think that's important today? You know, to have that sort of balance. I mean, you, I'm pretty sure you have a very demanding job. Mm. So, so, and many of us would probably fall into the trap of finding excuses. Mm. Uh, you know. So, how do you how do you carve the time, or or is it so important that you make sure that you know you you have that you you keep that time mm. uh, locked for certain activities my biggest hobby per se is 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 uh, off-road cars and i think that came to me when i was uh 15 years old and and a friend of mine in, in town had a beautiful 4x4 that took him to places that were gorgeous right beautiful sunsets beautiful vistas uh, great places to camp uh rivers in in the beautiful mountains of lebanon and that kind of hit two birds with, with one stone. The mechanical aspect, which is something I love, uh, and how things work, uh, and gears that grind, um, and the science behind that, and then obviously the great outdoors. Um, so that has been building for the past 25, 25 years plus. Um, some, some call it an obsession. <laughs> that could be a good term to use it. But it's, it's very important. I mean, I, I read an article maybe a couple of months ago that said if you don't have a hobby, pick up one. And I, I read it on purpose because I wanted to justify my actions to my spouse. Yeah. You know, I want to tell my wife, Your like, expenditures look. expenditures on, uh, on off-road. Well, not, not only financial <laughs> expenditure, but also mental expenditure yeah, and, and emotional. time commitment. And emotional well. and time commitment, obviously. It's a very well-authored uh, article about how having a, a hobby will allow you to kind of escape your brain. And it's like the experiences today. So we're in an economy where, where, where goods still have a value, right? But it's not about the goods economy. It's about the experience economy. Well, I've had my own experience for 25 years, and that's an escapism that has allowed me to to either reset my brain, or reset my emotions, set a goal for myself, right, uh, and then zone out. I mean, um, maintaining my motorcycle every month for two, three hours, whether it's, you know, lubing up the chain or making sure the tires are the right pressure with my AirPods on and having a good playlist uh, on my iTunes, is a is a gorgeous experience you know it's like people painting or people cycling or, or other things so i think it's very important to have the, that, that hobby if you're able to do it and share it with people you love even better so i've been able to transform again to use that term uh, my hobby from being just me myself and i with my machine to friends and now to my kids so we go camping much regularly uh, now that the kids are older enough 
uh, and they love it. You know, I mean, obviously they're probably going there for the s'mores uh, in the evening, which are very tasty, but it's also for the experience. And I think that's also something that I'm able to share with them. Uh, going back to, to business now, mm. uh, today is the age of, you know, personal brands. You, have, mm. you see a lot of people. I mean, it's so easy today to actually build a brand, which is amazing. What do you think is going to happen next after this? You know, if, if you're a company that uh, that works with OMD and, and you want to try to predict mm. like the next five years, mm. do, do, you, do you see any kind of trends? Um, a lot of we see a lot of trends. We see a lot of technological trends that will kind of converge all towards even more con- uh, convenience. I think the convenience of having of ordering something and waiting a day or two for it to be delivered is going to be a thing of the past. Well, that's already al- almost a thing of the past. Yes, I mean, uh, if if it's stocked in the country, yes. But most items that you want sometimes are not stocked in the market. The right size, the right color, um, the right volume, right? So I think. Today, convenience is going to go on a on a huge growth spurt in terms of in terms of convergence of all these technology into convenience, and I think the biggest one that's going to lead to that is audio. Um, you know, we we forget that the majority of the world doesn't live on English, French, and other established languages. Uh, even spelling something in Arabic that's a multinational brand is is tough for this region, but uh, saying it out loud to your phone. Uh, and managing audio with all these different devices by different companies at your home um, will allow you to have access to things much faster. So the speech recognition... The speech basically. recognition is going to be something that's going to be much more technologically advanced and audio as an overall uh, piece will be much much smarter. So moving forward, uh, you need to have an audio-enabled mentality. And I think that's going to lead all towards convenience. Okay. And I think the world of value has has been established. You know, today... Most folks, I think 62% of folks based on the last research, will only purchase at discount, right? And I think that's a that's a big statement. So the world of value has been established. The world of convenience is yet, is yet to be established. And I think that's the next big thing. Very interesting. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you 10 questions. Sure. Uh, and you're going to give me a one-word answer. Sure. Okay, very, very unprompted. Uh, okay. Um, so what's your favorite car? Um, Land Rover Defender. Oh wow! Okay, I thought you were gonna say something else. Yeah. Uh, what's your favorite animal? Uh, polar bear. What's the best cuisine? Lebanese. What makes you anxious? Hmm. What makes me anxious? Mm. Conformity. What's what motivates you? Fun. What's a uh, best pastime activity? Tajji. Mm. I'll have to explain <laughs> that though. <laughs> you have to explain yeah. that. What's Tajji? <laughs> Tajji is a game we used to play in uh, Brumana High School where I was brought up. <laughs> That's a combination of tennis, soccer, in a confined field. And and the forty three other people listening to this that know what I'm what I'm saying will, will be smiling and the other <laughs> millions of people will be will be probably confused. Okay, so it's a sport. It's a sport. Okay. Uh what's your favorite book? The goal. Okay. What's your favorite movie? Hmm. Star Wars. Oh uh, okay, that I knew. Any of them. That I knew. Uh what is something you regret? Hmm. I regret not being not taking seriously how to be fit. So to be fit, physically fit. Okay. And what's something you love? Food. <laughs> Which goes with the first question, <laughs> the previous question. <laughs> okay, thanks Nadim. Cool. I think that's a wrap for us. Thank you. Uh, it was fun. Thanks for your time. I had a had a fantastic time. Likewise. Great insights. Thank you. Thank you. I'd love to hear your feedback. You can support the show by subscribing for free and leaving us a review on any of the platforms. Until next time, stay safe, everyone.